We'll be turning to 1 Corinthians 16. We're going to read the uh, first half of the chapter this morning. But let's pray before we do that. Dear Father, we thank you for this word and we thank you, Lord, for all that we can learn for it as well as what the Corinthians learned in their day. And we pray, Lord, that as we consider some of the verses here this morning, Lord, that you would enlighten us, Lord. That you give us your mind, Lord, not my mind or anyone else's mind, Lord. Uh, not, not even Paul's mind, in a sense, but yours. And we pray, Lord, that we would understand what you're saying to each one of us, Lord. Uh, and would uh, act on it, Lord, where we need to and, or receive whatever we need to, Lord, from you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. And we express, Lord, again, our dependence on you to understand your word. Please help us, we pray. Amen. 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 1. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also. On the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper, so that no collections be made when I come. When I arrive, whomever you may approve, I will send them with letters to carry your gift to Jerusalem. And if it is fitting for me to go also, they will go with me. But I will come to you after I go through Macedonia, for I am going through Macedonia, and perhaps I will stay with you, or even spend the winter, so that you may send me on my way wherever I may go. For I do not wish to see you now just in passing, for I hope to remain with you for some time, if the Lord permits." But I will remain in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door for effective service has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. Now if Timothy comes, see that he is with you without cause to be afraid, for he is doing the Lord's work, as I also am. So let no one despise him, but send him on his way in peace, so that he may come to me, for I expect him with the brethren. But concerning Apollos our brother, I encouraged him greatly to come to you with the brethren. And it was not at all his desire to come now, but he will come when he has opportunity. Well, we're into the last chapter of 1 Corinthians, uh, the miscellaneous chapter, as I uh, put it in, in uh, when we were praying uh, at the back earlier and uh, of course Ray said who's miscellaneous um, who is she he said um, so I thought it was worthy of, of note uh, but no 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 not worthy no. okay apparently some don't want that kind of uh, uh, joke passed on uh, but there we go you can use that uh, but it is the miscellaneous chapter because it's uh, various different topics that come up um, I thought I'd uh, finished with the uh, uh, the difficult topics uh, in 1 Corinthians, but uh, we're going to be spending most of the time, I think, focusing on giving this morning. Um, uh, was, this is um, uh, what he's talked about uh, in verses 1 to 4, and we'll also consider a bit more briefly some of the other things, as I think they're uh, fairly straightforward. Uh, but these verses at the start of uh, the chapter seem to respond to a desire in the Corinthians to give. Uh, we know something of that from 2 Corinthians in chapters 8 and 9, which we'll mention more briefly uh, later. Uh, we see Paul talking about their previously promised gift. Uh, so at some point, the Corinthians promised or said they wanted to give uh, to uh, the ministry, which we're uh, going to consider. Uh, also in 2 Corinthians, it said they had a zeal or an initial zeal uh, to give to the work, and actually that influenced other churches to want to give as well. So I don't think this is kind of coming out of the blue to the Corinthians. Uh, I don't think this is Paul saying, you've never thought about this before, but now you need to give. I, I think that they may be in response to a desire that the Corinthians have previously expressed. Uh, but either way, uh, we see that in 2 Corinthians they had a zeal to give. Uh, so this appeal didn't fall entirely on deaf ears and we'll consider that more later um, so we should bear that in mind when we're uh, reading these verses but it talks about the collection for the saints and it talks about carrying the gift to Jerusalem so Jerusalem is the destination for uh, this particular gift uh, there are probably other things that they gave to and causes and no doubt they thought of the poor in Corinth I hope 
but this is a specific gift, a special gift to uh, the saints in Jerusalem. Uh, now we know from Acts 11 that there was a famine uh, in the world, uh, the known world at least, I don't know what that quite means, all over the world it says, uh, and that it was particularly going to uh, affect those living in and around Jerusalem. Because in Acts 11 and verse 27, some prophets come down from Jerusalem uh, to Antioch, where Paul and others were uh, based, uh, or we saw at that point. And in verse 28 it says, one of those prophets named Agabus stood up and began to indicate by the spirit that there would certainly be a great famine all over the world. And this took place in the reign of Claudius. And in the proportion that any of the disciples had means, in other words, to whatever extent they had money, uh, each of them determined to send a contribution for the relief of the brethren living in Judea. And this they did, sending it in charge of Barnabas and Saul, which is Paul, to the elders. Now this was some time before Paul wrote the letter 1 Corinthians, uh, but no doubt the effects were still being felt. Uh, and we see that the church in Antioch, uh, each of these people in this church decided to send a contribution. Uh, so they all decided and they gave according to their means, which is uh, relevant as we consider what Paul says here. Uh, so there's a specific need in Judea. Uh, in and around Jerusalem. Uh, we also see that mentioned in Romans. Um, in Romans 15 and verse 25. Paul talks about going to Jerusalem. To Jerusalem, Serving the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make a contribution for the poor. Among the saints in Jerusalem. Uh, and he also actually mentions in that passage in Romans. Uh, that uh, in a sense we as believers, as Gentile believers, have received from the Jews. Uh, in one sense, of course, Jesus was Jewish. Uh, the law in the Old Testament, which we consider largely based around the Jews. Uh, and he says uh, in that passage, if the Gentiles have shared in their spiritual things, they are indebted to minister them also in material things. I don't know if that's a principle to take at all the times, although we're always to pray for uh, Jerusalem and for the Jews. Uh, but clearly at this point, Paul says, well, here are Jews in need and also people who you have benefited from in some way. Let's return the favour and let's remember these poor. Uh, so this isn't a one off thing he says to the Corinthians alone. He's speaking to other churches and other churches uh, are aware of it. In the passage in Corinthians, he talks about uh, something he said to the Galatians. Uh, we don't see that particularly mentioned in the book of Galatians. Uh, and um, we don't really know a lot about what he said to Galatia, except that it must have been similar to what he said here. Uh, so we can guess. Uh, but clearly this was a large scale relief work involving a number of churches. Um, Paul was basically being the early church's Barnabas fund, we could say. Uh, in some way, he uh, and others were coordinating money for believers in Jerusalem. But he says to give, or, or, or rather to set aside uh, money or possessions, whatever it might have been, uh, on the first day of the week. Uh, and we might ask why, why the first day of the week? Uh, maybe that this was because this was the day uh, when they met, and maybe that uh, he was encouraging them to uh, put things aside as a church. Uh, the, some have even suggested maybe there was a, a treasury that they would all bring things to uh, when they met. Uh, maybe that's the case. Or maybe it was a collection to be made at home and the first day of the week was the natural day to say. If you had to pick a day between one and seven, you might actually pick one. Uh, but either way, it doesn't really matter um, really uh, what day uh, the collection was to be made. For me, the thing that spoke to me most was that this was to be methodical. This was to be uh, organised. It wasn't just uh, as and when you remember or as and when you particularly feel like it. He encourages them to be methodical in setting aside money to give to this uh, relief work, you know, to this uh, giving really to the Lord uh, as well as to uh, the saints. Uh, now, obviously, we're to be led by the Holy Spirit in all the areas of our lives. We should walk uh, by the Spirit, walk with the Spirit's leading 
giving is one of many areas where we should seek the Lord's guidance for. Uh, so while there are general principles in the word, we should each seek the Lord for ourselves as to what and how and when uh, and who to give to. Uh, and in this situation, Paul doesn't say uh, everybody give um, ten pounds for the sake for the sake of argument, or everyone give a hundred. He doesn't even say everybody give uh, X percent. He doesn't set uh, a strict amount, but he says to give as each one prospers. Uh, suggests something similar to a tithe. We'll consider that in a moment. Um, but basically where as each person earns, they give. If somebody earns a large amount, that they would give a larger amount than some who earned a smaller amount. But Paul seems to be suggesting to be methodical, at least in uh, how they set the money aside. And I think that's perhaps a good principle to have a set way that we give, at least in some uh, way. Uh, because I know for me, when I just leave it to when I remember or when I feel like it, uh, sometimes it, it doesn't get done. And that's not just true of giving, it's true of various things on my job list, uh, which I won't go into now. Uh, but I'm sure you're the same in the business of life. We can think, yeah, I really want to do that. And if we don't prioritise it uh, and get it in the diary or, or get on with it or whatever, it doesn't happen. And that can be the same for giving. Uh, I know there have been times when I've heard something, uh, it's moved me. I thought, yeah, I really need to give to that. Um, but if I don't prioritise and get on with it, months later I think, oh, do you know what? The opportunity, sometimes the opportunity's passed and I can't now give and, and I wish I'd done it. Uh, and so I think there's some merit in having some kind of system to make sure that we give what we feel the Lord is saying. Um, about a year later in uh, 2 Corinthians, uh, Paul's second later letter shows he's actually concerned in case they weren't ready to give. They expressed an initial zeal. He's just wanting to be sure that they will actually follow through with it. Uh, obviously understanding the human tendencies that we can have to change our minds or, or to forget. Um, and uh, on a practical note, on today's terms, uh, one way which some people give uh, in a methodical way is to give every month. Uh, we receive uh, maybe a salary or whatever it might be every month. Uh, it's natural that we might give every month. Uh, however that works. Uh, some people give by uh, standing order. Some people just make a note and use diaries. Uh, I'm of the standing order type because I would forget if I used a diary. Um, but, you know, whatever it is, uh, Paul's, we could say Paul's message is um, uh, do this methodically. Make sure you follow through with this. Uh, make sure you have a set way to give so that it doesn't get uh, neglected. Now, um, I said I was, wasn't quite through with difficult subjects, and uh, one of the reasons it's difficult to talk about giving uh, is that, uh, obviously, it looks like you're making an appeal for money, uh, which certainly I am not doing in any way, shape or form uh, at all. And, uh, you know, if you felt that it was right to give uh, your money or some of your money to other works, uh, in a sense, I would say, hallelujah, the Lord's work is being, um, is being built up. Uh, while there's a need for the church here to be supported, for obvious reasons, uh, it's not that I'm standing here saying, you must give all your money to us. Uh, I, I'm being very blunt about this. Let's not uh, be polite about this. Um, let's, let's be honest. I am not in any way trying to make an appeal. And I don't want anybody to think that I'm doing that. I'm just trying to preach through what uh, I have here. Um, but... At the risk of, of sounding like I am, uh, I mentioned standing order, because it's the only time I'll ever be able to mention this uh, in, when going through a passage, simply for the practical reason that whether it's to us or to others, standing orders can be gift-aided. Mm -hmm. uh, ah, it's a very practical point. It shouldn't be kind of uh, ignored. Uh, Gift-aid is not some dodgy thing. Uh, it is a completely legal thing. I looked on the government's website this morning. It's all there. Uh, they say very clearly that uh, gift aid is there to be to be used for charitable purposes. The church and other organisations uh, are charities. And the reason for saying it, of course, is that uh, if you can have things gift aided, uh, there is more money going into the Lord's kingdom. Yeah. Uh, I would even go as far as saying money that otherwise the government might use in other ways that we might not necessarily approve of. 
Um, and uh, that's not in any way getting our taxes. We should pay our taxes. Oh, I'm opening a can of worms here, aren't I? Um, we should definitely pay our taxes. Jesus said to pay taxes, so I'm not in any way suggesting getting out of that. Uh, and we're to pray for our governments. This is not something where we are getting a government. Uh, but at the end of the day, in my mind, it's better if money can be used directly for the Lord's kingdom than uh, left for the government to decide how to, how to spend it. Uh, personal opinion. I'm not saying the Bible says that. Uh, so I mention this, open the can of worms, I'll close it in a minute, uh, simply because uh, if it's something you might consider, if you don't already, that it's a way of giving more money, or, or it's not even you giving it, of gaining more money for the Lord's service. Naturally this creates a problem because we're told we should give in secret. Uh, it's a, that's a completely biblical principle that Jesus says to make sure that we um, uh, don't give in a way that's showing off. I understand that completely. Uh, only one person in the church knows who gives what. Uh, I would say that, but I completely understand if that's your conviction. Um, but I would just submit it to you to consider, um, besides the fact it's being organised, uh, it's a way of obtaining more money for the Lord's kingdom. And I'm not saying that specifically for here. The same if you give to others, uh, an organisation that we give to, we sign a gift aid form so that they get the benefit. There we go. Can closed. Uh, kind of, because we now need to talk about tithing. Um, <laughs> tithing, here we go. Uh, I mentioned tithing because although uh, Paul doesn't say uh, set aside a tenth, naturally this is what comes to many people's minds when we're thinking about giving and, and giving proportionally. Uh, a tithe literally means, well, basically means a tenth. It's a portion of, of ten. Uh, in other words, the idea of giving 10% of our income now, tithing was an Old Testament rule for Israel. Uh, that's the first thing we should say. Uh, tithing was a rule given by Moses to the Israelites. Uh, and um, actually, we might think that they gave 10%, but I read recently that actually it worked out about 23% or something like that. Because uh, there's one tithe they were to give for one work. Uh, one tithe they were to give for another, and another tithe they were to give once every three years, which they say works out 23%. Now, I haven't looked this up, uh, so I'll leave it for you if you're curious to look it up. It's interesting, uh, but whether that's the case, either way, the point is, uh, tithing was something that was given to the Israelites, and they were to take 10% or whatever of their harvest uh, and support the Levites and the priests to support the Lord's work, basically, uh, with that. But it was also done before Moses at times, out of gratitude to God, rather than because they were commanded to. Uh, Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils of war uh, to Melchizedek, no doubt out of gratitude for the Lord giving him the victory in the battle that he fought. Uh, Jacob uh, promised God a tenth of all his income if God brought him back safely. Obviously, he's trying to put a condition on it there, which is I'm not condoning this. Uh, but we see that the principle is there. Um, so uh, Abraham and Jacob both uh, believed in uh, uh, giving a tenth to the Lord. There is no New Testament passage I can see that commands 10 percent. Unless you take a certain passage of what Jesus said in a certain uh, way, which I'll just mention because it was interesting. I, I read about this. Uh, in Matthew 23 and verse 23, uh, Jesus is talking to the scribes and the Pharisees specifically. Uh, and he says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, in Matthew 23, 23, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. And somebody made the point, well, Jesus is saying you should tithe and also do X, Y and Z. Uh, what he talks about, uh, justice and mercy and faithfulness. Now, you might say, well, he's talking to those who are under the law uh, and he's talking to them uh, and not necessarily to all believers. Uh, I don't think it makes uh, that much difference, really. Uh, but I just mention it uh, because some might point to that and say, uh, this is the Lord commanding us to tithe. I'm not so sure that is what Jesus is, is necessarily saying to us. But I um, mention it just because tithing comes up in these kind of situations. Uh, the clear principle from what Paul is saying is whatever the percent, give according to your means 
and give according to the Lord's will and the Lord's guidance for us. And if we take that away uh, more than anything else, that's the most important thing. And cheerfully, indeed. Yes, you rush ahead. I was going to mention that in a moment. But yes, absolutely. Uh, Give cheerfully. We're to give willingly. No use making a gift if you're giving it grudgingly. It might bring benefit anyway, but it it, uh, obviously isn't right in the Lord's sight to give grudgingly. Uh, But as we're just finishing on the matter of tithes, uh, a passage people often talk about is Malachi 3. And verse 8, where the Lord is uh, speaking quite strongly to Israel, again, to Israel, as specifically as regards tithes. Uh, But the principle, again, is interesting, because in Malachi 3 and verse 8, God says, Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, How have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, this is Israel, uh, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, so that there may be food in my house. And test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Then I will rebuke the devourer for you, so that it will not destroy the fruits of the ground. Nor will your vine in the field cast its grapes, says the Lord of hosts. All the nations will call you blessed. For you shall be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Here was a situation where the state, the nation of Israel were not following the commands of Moses. They weren't supporting the Lord's work. Um, I can't remember if it was there or elsewhere where it talks about basically that the priests or Levites were having to kind of support themselves because it, uh, they weren't being provided for. Uh, but here was the Israel not following the Lord's commands. And the Lord says, bring that tithe in, bring it all in, and then you will receive a blessing. And obviously it's talking about a material blessing here. Uh, We've got to be careful about applying that to ourselves today and assuming that the Lord will necessarily bless us uh, materially. Uh, He might do as we give. But definitely there is a principle that as we give to the Lord, he will bless us in one way or, or another. Uh, just as other things where we obey the Lord, because giving is obedience, uh, just like uh, loving others, as we love others, the Lord can bless us, uh, as we pray and follow the Lord's word in various ways, he is pleased with us and wants to bless us. So it's a similar principle. But there we go, there's uh, tithing for you. It's not uh, clearly given to us as a percentage as believers, uh, but it is a principle and is something we should uh, take note of. So back in our passage now, uh, Paul says that there are to be no collections when he comes. Uh, Perhaps that's to ensure everyone's prepared, uh, has everything ready in advance. Uh, Maybe to avoid people feeling suddenly under pressure as a a basket is just handed round and they have to quickly make a decision. Um, Maybe he wants them just to make sure again that they're organised and and not having to give under pressure. And again, in 2 Corinthians 9, it says each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So there's to be no compulsion uh, and no pressure. And anybody who puts people under pressure to give to them uh, is not following what the the word says. And Paul isn't trying to make a collection for himself. Uh, as many of the prosperity gospel people do, he's making a collection for the saints in Jerusalem. Mm. And he doesn't even decide how it will be spent. He takes it then to the leaders in Jerusalem. Um, So Paul's not trying to line his own pockets or his own ministry. Uh, Very briefly, before we move on to other parts of this passage, just want to just give you a quick summary of what it says in 2 Corinthians 9 and 10. Uh, in other circumstances I would have spent uh, one or two messages in there um, but as it, we may well come to that uh, after 1 Corinthians uh, we might do that uh, I didn't want to talk about them too much but they are relevant so let me just, just pick out the key verses from those chapters and we'll look at them properly uh, hopefully in um, uh, about a year or time or, or whatever, however long it might be um, just, just hold on um, but in 2 Corinthians uh, 8, I've said 8, sorry, I said 9 and 10, I meant uh, 8 and 9. In 2 Corinthians 8, uh, verse 2, uh, Paul points out 
that the Macedonians had been liberal, liberal in giving beyond their ability, not just um, a proportion that they could just you know, happily give away, but beyond their ability. Uh, even in, or, in an ordeal of affliction and deep poverty, they even begged in some way to be included in the giving. These are people who are keen. Um, he says in verse 7 that the Corinthians were abounding in other areas. They were abounding in faith and in love and in knowledge. So abound in this too. This is just another part of the Christian life. He's saying. He says in verse 8 that it's a chance to prove the sincerity of their love. It's all very well saying we love people, but is it shown in our actions? Not just in giving, but in time and other things that we might do. Uh, in verse 10, he said, a year ago, you desired to give. Now, basically, follow through. Don't just desire it and not do it. In verse 13, he's basically saying it's good to have uh, a financial equality in some way uh, within the church as a whole. Not some churches that are mega rich, ignoring the churches that are poor. Uh, in chapter 9 and verse 2, he says that the Corinthians initial zeal had stirred other churches up. Uh, those Macedonians he talked about earlier that were giving beyond their ability, they had been inspired by the Corinthian zeal. And it shows the example we can set. Uh, although how that matches up with giving in secret, that's another story. But I suppose the fact that there's a church, they were giving an amount or wanting to give an amount, it sets an example for other churches. He lays down the principle in verse 6 that those who sow sparingly will reap sparingly. Those who sow bountifully will reap bountifully. Again saying, well, if you're not prepared to give of time or money or other things to the Lord, you can't expect very much uh, back. Uh, but as we see, it's not necessarily that we get things back financially. Uh, because uh, in verse 8, Paul talks, uh, and, and following, he talks about uh, receiving uh, grace and seed for good deeds, for liberality, and for a harvest of righteousness. Uh, not for a new car. Uh, or other things so the Lord might give things at times for that uh, but Paul is saying you'll reap bountifully in these ways at least that's what it seems to be saying uh, uh, we've already seen in verse 7 that we should decide how much to give on, not under compulsion God loves a cheerful giver and finally the other point is in verse 13 that the recipients of the gift they give will glorify God which is one of the most important things we can do and yearn for the Corinthians in prayer. So these people, he's saying, will be so grateful, they will pray for you and pray for a blessing for you. Uh, and it also really links giving with the gospel, uh, obedience to the gospel of Christ. Uh, so I'm sorry to just skip over those briefly, but I, I don't want to kind of cover stuff uh, so long, which then I won't be able to cover when we go through um, that. But you can have a look through those chapters in your own time and meditate on them and ask the Lord to speak to you from them. But in the remaining time, I just want to look more briefly now at the rest of this first half of the chapter. And Paul says that he's going to come to them uh, after going through Macedonia. And he's basically saying he doesn't want to make a flying visit. Uh, this is back in 1 Corinthians 16. He doesn't want to make a flying visit. He wants to uh, spend a decent amount of time with them. Which is remarkable when you think of all the problems at Corinth. Uh, and I think I said this on the very first message at the start of this series. Uh, that despite all the things he's going to have to challenge them on and criticise them. He starts out very lovingly at the start. He, uh, and in other parts of the letter he does praise them for things. So despite all these issues that he could be, well humanly speaking, could be mad at them for. Uh, he has a real love for them. He wants to spend time with them. Uh, no doubt some would have wanted to stay away. Having written this letter, you can imagine it might have been a bit awkward, uh, depending on how they received it. Some might have wanted to keep their distance, but not Paul. He loves them too much for that. Uh, uh, even though some were his supporters, and some were, some said, I am of Paul, and some said, I am of Apollos, uh, he wants to come to them, uh, Apollos, although doesn't think it's right now, wants to come to them soon. So neither of them are bearing any grudges. He wants to spend a decent amount of time. Actually, Paul says in Romans 1, he talks about wanting to come to see the Romans. 
um, and wanting, if it's the will of God, to come to them uh, to impart a spiritual gift to them and to encourage them and build each other's faith up. So Paul sees the value of meeting together and of building each other up. And he wants to do this for the Corinthians. There is no ill will here at all. But in that passage and in our passage, we see Paul doesn't make his own plans and decide everything for himself and stick to his own ideas. He has desires. He has ideas. He wants to come to the Corinthians. He wanted to come to the Romans. Sometimes he tries an idea. But he recognises the final decision is with God. If you turn briefly to Acts 16, we see an example of this. Acts 16 and verse 6. This is speaking about Paul and others who are making missionary journeys. It says, Acts 16 verse 6, they passed through the Phrygian, very cold, uh, and, Gal- no. and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. Forbidden. They wanted to speak in Asia, perhaps, but they were forbidden. It wasn't the Lord's plan at that time for those people specifically to go to Asia. Other times we see Paul does go to Asia. And after they came to Mysia, they were going into Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. Again, they, um, they were trying to go there. Paul perhaps trying an idea, but the Spirit said, no, that's not where I want you. And then in the next verse, we see that Paul sees a vision. Someone from Macedonia appeals to him to come. And they concluded in verse 10 that God had called them to preach the gospel there. Paul might have made plans or tried to, but he knew the final decision was with the Lord. And we see that in our past in Corinthians 2, uh, in 1 Corinthians as well. So Paul says, I really want to come to you. My plan is to come to you. Later in 2 Corinthians, we see the plan slightly changed. But we do know from Acts 20 uh, that they, he does eventually kind of follow through with his plan. Um, and we'll probably see that when we go through, hopefully, 2 Corinthians. <coughs> but for the time being, Paul's plans were submitted to the Lord to see how he led them. And it's worth bearing that in mind for our decisions, of course, that while we make plans and we try to go ahead with plans, we recognise, uh, we look to the Lord, and we recognise the Lord might want to change them. Mm-hmm. Paul, in our passage, uh, then basically says that he's going to stay at Ephesus for a time because there's a great and effective door uh, and there are many adversaries. Many adversaries, many opponents Uh, We see an example of the opposition he faced in Ephesus in Acts 19, where Demetrius, the silversmith, raises up, effectively raises up a riot uh, because uh, he and other idol makers are losing their money. Um, But I think that was after when Paul was talking, because straight after this riot, Paul leaves Ephesus. Uh, But I think it's an example of some of the uh, uh, opposition they faced. They also faced opposition from the synagogue, from uh, the non-believing Jews who uh, disagreed with him. Uh, But the point is, he was focusing here on the opportunities, not the problems. At the risk of sounding like some kind of positive thinking guru, uh, which I am not in any way. I think I'm quite bad at it, actually. Um, Okay. Uh, at, the, at the risk of sounding like that, thank you, one or two. At the risk of sounding like that, uh, I have to say Paul is an optimist here with the Lord's help. He saw a door of opportunity and he saw adversaries. So he said, I'm going to stay. He's focusing on the door, not the adversaries. Uh, and that's a really good example for us. He trusted God for help. Maybe the fact there were adversaries encouraged him more to stay. Maybe that spurred him on thinking, no, I I really want to fight the Lord's battles here. And I really want to make sure that the uh, believers have help, maybe. But either way, the Lord is focused on, uh, the Lord, uh, Paul is focused on the opportunities. So let's seek to be those people uh, who say, I have problems, I have opportunities, I'm pushing on with the Lord's help. And then Paul says uh, about Timothy's arrangements in verse 10 of 1 Corinthians 16. 
He says, if Timothy comes, see that he is with you without cause to be afraid. Again, Timothy's plans are perhaps uncertain or Paul doesn't know them uh, fully. He says, Timothy is doing the Lord's work uh, as I also am, so let no one despise him. Despise. You might have heard that word in other verses. A despise basically meaning to treat someone with contempt or to look down on them, um, to count them as nothing or to reject them. The same word was used of Jesus in how he was treated by Herod and his soldiers. Uh, Herod at first wanted to hear from him. He wanted to see a miracle. But when he saw Jesus was staying quiet, he and his men mocked him. They despised him. They rejected him. Uh, it's also used by Paul uh, in Romans 14 when talking about uh, how to treat people who fought differently to them in what they could eat. Actually, if you just turn there briefly, you can see uh, what I'm talking about uh, in Romans 14 and verse 1. Romans 14 and verse 1. Now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. One person has faith that he may eat all things. In other words, one person believes that they are okay to eat all kinds of types of food. But he who is weak eats vegetables only. Uh, so in other words, he who is maybe, uh, maybe has less of an understanding of what the Lord has done in Christ. Uh, maybe to be on the safe side, they only eat certain types of food. The one who eats is not to regard with contempt, same words in the Greek, the one who does not eat. And the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. And the first verse of the next chapter says, Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength. And not just please ourselves. So Paul's saying, you know, whether you are uh, weak, uh, maybe a new believer, maybe lacking understanding, or you are mature and you have a great understanding by the Lord's grace. Either way, uh, don't look down on each other. You know, uh, particularly, I guess, speaking to those who are more mature, not to look down on those who are less. After all, it's only by the Lord's mercy that any of us can reach any maturity. It's not anything of our own ability. And some people can be more mature after a year of knowing the Lord than others after 40 years. Yeah. Um, so we need to bear that in mind. It's not just a kind of hierarchy based on when we came to know the Lord, uh, though it can help. Uh, but Paul says you are not to despise them just because uh, you know more than them or are stronger than them spiritually or whatever. You're not to uh, make fun of them or mock them, but you are to accept them and encourage them even. If you also turn to 1 Timothy 4, we can see this explained further, because this is a letter to Timothy himself. In 1 Timothy 4 and verse 11. Generally, in the letter to Timothy, we get a picture of somebody who maybe is a bit more timid, maybe a bit more uncertain in different ways. In 1 Timothy 4 verse 11... Paul, talking about what's come before, says, prescribe and teach these things. So there's a, a reminder of the duty he has to teach others. Let no one look down on your youthfulness, uh, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. In verse 15, it says, take pains with these things, and be absorbed in them. So that your progress will be evident to all. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things. For as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. Paul talks about your youthfulness. Now this doesn't necessarily, just doesn't necessarily make him a teenager. Certainly he wouldn't, I don't think he would have been a teenager at that point. Uh, some have said that this could mean he could be in his 30s. Um, it depends, obviously different cultures see young people in uh, different ways. Uh, but clearly he was younger than some in the church. 
uh, as it necessarily happens very often uh, for those who are uh, in leadership. Um, and uh, there is a danger that people might look down on it. He recognised it here. He recognised it in 1 Corinthians where we read. And he's encouraged them not to look down on him. And he suggests it might be to do with his youthfulness. Uh, but Paul is saying, no, actually, your job is to, to teach. Uh, you have an authority here that you've been given to teach. Um, and you are to not let people look down on you. He says, instead, to set an example. The best way you can get people to stop looking down on you uh, is to show. I was going to say show what you're made of, but that puts it across wrong because it's not about us. Um, but as we set an example, hopefully people come to... Uh, First of all, glorify God for what he's done in us Mm -hmm. uh, and also to perhaps be more willing to listen to us, because as they see what the Lord has done in us, they might think, okay, maybe the Lord has something to say through them. Uh, And so he says in speech, conduct, love, faith and purity, show yourself an example. All areas we should be an example to others in, in how much we do love others, in the way we behave and don't behave. Uh, in how pure we are, in the boundary, boundaries that we set in relationships and, and other areas, uh, in the things we say, in how much faith we have, uh, we should be uh, an example. Of course, an example both to non-believers as a witness to them and to other believers to encourage them to grow. You know, as we as if you're a believer and you see somebody praying with real faith, it encourages hopefully your faith. Uh, So Paul says, be an example. And um, it's uh, obviously something we can relate to, isn't it? Something being younger, uh, being looked down on. It happens in the workplace. Uh, If you're younger or less experienced, you can be looked down on. But Paul says, don't let that happen. Uh, And so he says back in Corinthians to make sure you don't despise him because he's doing the Lord's work. Don't think in human ways, he's saying effectively. Uh, in one sense, this is somebody who's serving the Lord. In fact, as we're going to consider next time, when we look at the second half, he singles out the household of Stephanus. If I've pronounced that right, Stephanus, yes. Uh, Stephanus, um, and saying those of that household devoted themselves to serving the saints. And he talks about being in subjection to them, uh, honouring them, we could say. We'll look at that more next time. Uh, but he's saying, here are people who are doing the Lord's work. Don't look down on them. Not that we should look down on anybody, of course. Uh, But, you know, show a special honour. And isn't that what it says elsewhere? I think it's in Hebrews. um, uh, Those who labour in the word are worthy of double honour. Is that Hebrews? Timothy, Timothy, that's what I said. Uh, Timothy. Uh, In Timothy, yes, that they're worthy of double honour. So there is to be an honour given, although not putting them uh, on a pedestal. Uh, So these are the uh, examples that um, Paul gives uh, of people who need to be uh, respected. And of course, the Corinthians were told off earlier in the letter for being divided based on who they followed. Some saying I'm Paul, some saying I'm of Apollos, some saying I'm of Peter, uh, trying to say, well, this is the person I follow. But of course, Paul says, no, we all follow Christ. We're not to put people uh, on pedestals. We're to honour everybody and not look down on people, uh, honour personal though if it helps illustrate it uh, I would like to um, express my gratitude that uh, although we have a pastor here who is uh, much more experienced uh, in every way than me and I suppose I'm speaking for Dave as well I hope he agrees with me um, that I'm grateful that that doesn't meant that you've not been wanting to hear what I have had to say uh, but that you have accepted me you've accepted Dave uh, and you know given us the opportunity to teach Uh, And not taking the attitude, um, if I can put it this way, uh, I am of Ray, Um, you know, uh, or I am of whatever teacher it is that you follow, which we shouldn't. Uh, We shouldn't put people on pedestals. But I want to express that uh, as I've got the, again, the only real opportunity to do this uh, is to say thank you for that. As it illustrates really that um, we are not to look down anybody. But I don't say it just about those in leadership. I say about everybody, that everyone here. Isn't that what we saw uh, when looking at spiritual gifts? Everyone here has a part to play. Everyone is a different part of the body. They may have different roles, but everyone has a part to play. That means everyone from the youngest, uh, maybe the newest believer or the youngest in age, to the oldest or the most experienced believer here, we all have a role to play. 
I, I was going to particularly give that encouragement to those who were baptised recently I recognize, uh, in recent years, and I recognise uh, most of them aren't here this morning. Uh, maybe they'll be able to listen to the recording, but I really wanted to encourage them. Um, because when you're a new believer particularly, if you've not opened your mouth in the meeting before, um, it can be really hard to do that. Uh, not that opening our mouths in the meeting is the only way we can serve the body, but you know, just to encourage everybody. Um, nobody should be looking down on you. For how you pray, or how long you pray, or what song you pick, um, or if you start a song and you're not singing it very well, um, uh, none of that should be an issue. We're meant to be a family, aren't we? That's what we're meant to be. Uh, and in a family, people are free to do things without fear of people kind of mocking them. Things need to be tested, of course. Uh, and uh, we have to be prepared for that um, but certainly we should all feel able uh, to um, to open our mouths and bring things and feel needed in that way so please if that uh, uh, speaks to you in any way do have the confidence and boldness to bring things knowing that none of us will criticise if anything you should have people afterwards thanking you certainly I had that the first time I prayed in a meeting and people afterwards uh, encouraged me and I really appreciated that and encouraged me to pray and certainly we should do that when we have people who are maybe more timid or maybe new um, to feel able to do that and be encouraged so uh, I've looked at a few different things today I, I hope that it, it's been of benefit to each of us in different ways um, we're going to look at the rest of what he says next time but let's really uh, take on board what he says uh, about the the fact we can give and give cheerfully to be uh, methodical in it in some way as you feel led by the Lord certainly to make it a priority uh, not to just let it slip by uh, and to make sure that uh, we are uh, leaving our plans open to the Lord to make sure we are uh, while we're making plans looking to him and not assuming we know what's best because Paul didn't with all his wisdom and to make sure we are treating everyone with respect uh, as we should do as believers. Let's come to the Lord in prayer and ask him to help us with those. Dear Lord, we want to start really by thanking you for everything you've given us, Lord. Uh, every bit of money, every bit of time, every possession, every relationship, uh, every bit of knowledge, Lord, it's all from you. And we want to acknowledge that, Lord, and, and uh, really, Lord, to say uh, we want you to direct us in all of these things and what we do with them. Uh, Lord, whether it's what we give to you or not, with everything that we spend and everything we do, would you uh, lead us, help us to know what things we should get and shouldn't and what things we should do with our time and what we shouldn't. But we particularly this morning want to pray for your wisdom in what we give to you, to your work, Lord, uh, wherever and whoever that might be, uh, that you'd give us wisdom in it. Uh, give us cheerful attitudes, Lord, and uh, whatever else we might need, Lord, uh, and we might know what your will is for us in these things. We pray, too, for our plans. Uh, we lay before you anybody who is trying to make plans at the moment, Lord, who is wanting to know the way ahead. Lord, help them to know it, Lord. Help them to look to you for the wisdom and to learn, as Paul did, Lord, how to really sense what your spirit is saying, the doors he's opening and the doors he's closing, Lord. We pray. And we pray you would indeed open doors for those who uh, need them open, Lord, in our fellowship, Lord. And Lord, we do want to pray for your help as a body to be uh, bold, Lord, in uh, playing our part and to be loving in uh, encouraging those uh, who are starting to do that. Lord, we de uh, declare again our need for you. Pray you'd help us, Lord, and give you the glory for placing us in this body. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.